Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we're speaking with Sean Flynn. Sean is the author of The Kitty Who Rescued Me After I Rescued Him and an award-winning finalist in the Animals, Pets, Narrative Nonfiction category of the 2017 International Book Awards. Sean spent over 25 years in a market research career before he stepped away to pursue his passion for writing. He knew he wanted to explore his deep connection with cats, particularly the first cat he ever rescued. Sean and his girlfriend, Carrie, live in Enfield, Connecticut, where he takes care of several indoor and outdoor cats. He also volunteers with the local cat rescue group, Enfield Community Cat Project, and was recently designated as the group's marketing representative. Sean, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Hi, Stacey. Thanks for having me on your program today. Yeah. So it sounds like you may be somewhat new to the community cat world. I was wondering, how did you first get interested in helping community cats? Well, uh, a few months back, I became familiar with the local cat rescue organization where I live, Enfield Community Cat Project. And uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, I certainly love cats. I have have a huge love for cats. I uh, have four cats that I live with in my home, and I have uh, several that live in my backyard that I take care of, that I feed and stuff like that. But, you know, I've I've always loved cats, and I, I wrote this book that I published this past winter, I've always just had a love for uh, cats, and and I I wanted to uh, get involved in the community, and I uh, met the person who runs the group, and so we hit it off right away, and we've been doing lots of events together, fundraising events together, and I've been helping them out by writing press releases, you know, marketing materials, things like that. So tell me about the journey that you went through in the process of writing this book. Tell me about Kitty, and tell me about the reason why you decided to write a book in the first place. Well, I first met Kitty when I moved to the house that I currently live in. He was actually, according to my next-door neighbor, he was actually living in my backyard for two or three years before I moved in. He was just the coolest cat. I I moved in on a Saturday. Uh, We'll we'll actually backtrack a minute. About two months before I moved into the house, I was walking in the backyard just trying to get a feel for the property with the realtor, and this big bushy orange cat was hanging around. He came over and rubbed up up against my leg. He was real friendly, and I, I, I thought it was just a neighbor's cat. Didn't think much of it. Well, I ended up moving into the house two months later. I moved in on a Saturday, got home from work on Monday night, and he was sitting on the front step like he was waiting for me to, for me to get home. <laughs> and, you know, it, it was just a great story. I mean, I had such such a good experience with him. I mean, I wasn't much of a cat person before I met him. Not, not that I wasn't a cat person. I just didn't have a lot of experience with him. And I met him, and, and he changed my life. But I am now a cat person as a result of meeting Kitty. And were there other things that Kitty helped you in the process of having him as your pet? Well, yeah, I actually went through a difficult time in my life, and having him in my life actually helped me to get through it. A lot of emotional support, and it was just great. I mean, he ended up becoming my best friend. (laughs) He, He certainly had a huge impact on my life. And that's why I decided to write a book about it. It's a great story, getting lots of great feedback about it, and just wanted to share share my story with people. Had you ever written a book before? Nope. This is my first book, my debut book. (laughs) I mean, from my standpoint, my, my husband is a freelance writer, so I know the time, the effort, the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into writing fiction, nonfiction, pretty much anything. And so... It's a decision that I would think one would not do lightly. I, you were had a market research career, but yet it sounds like you've always had a passion and a love for writing. Did you have that passion in childhood, or was it just the story of Kitty that you were like, I have to write this down, almost more for you than for anybody else? 
Well, it, it's funny you ask me that, Stacy, because I absolutely did write this for myself. I had no plans on trying to get it published or promoting it as a book. I wrote the story down purely for myself, and I share it with my friends and family, and they were really touched, and many encouraged me to see if I could get it published. So uh, I, it actually took me about two weeks to write the initial uh, draft, and uh, you know, and, and then after that, it, t- it took me several months to, you know, kind of agonizing over it and making some modifications here and changing some things and adding some things and deleting some things and getting it to the point where I thought it was ready to, to be published. But um, initially, you know, I just banged it out in a couple of weeks. I mean, as I said, I didn't write it to try to get it published. But then after I thought about it, and, well, you know, maybe I should see if I can get it published. It's a great story. So uh, yeah. that's kind of how, how that, that, that worked. So the kitty who rescued me after I rescued him is the name of the book. And it's a book that has been available since early 2017, or did it launch back in the fall of 2016? Well, I actually published it in late 2016. But since this is my first book, I wasn't familiar with the publishing industry. And I've learned a lot about book publishing in the last several months. And I ended up republishing it just last month in April. And I selected a new cover. I chose a new picture for the cover. I reformatted the interior. It's the exact same story. The original version that I published, I didn't own the ISBN number. So what I did is I purchased my own ISBN number. So basically now I control all distribution rights for my book, where originally I didn't. I didn't own, I used a free ISBN from uh, CreateSpace. I learned that they own the distribution rights. So Create Space is an Amazon owned company, and I was able to upload it to Amazon, but I couldn't use other printers to print the book. But now that I own the ISBN number, I can. Mm. So, one thing that I always find interesting, and then this is about storytelling. When I was working with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society and in fundraising and in marketing, you know, everybody's like, you have to have a story. You have to tell a story. The way to raise funds, to raise awareness is through the story. And I found it incredibly difficult to actually choose the stories because there are so many cats involved in our organization, so many cats coming through the door. And I felt every cat, every kitten, had a compelling story. They were answering for me, my why. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? And really, I could look at every cat and say, this is why I'm here. So I almost was in decision paralysis about the stories. But if your organization did have that really particularly compelling story or something really unique that they wanted to share with the big and wide world, would you recommend embarking on this process of actually producing a book to share with others? Well, sure. I mean, anyone can write a book. I mean, it's the story. You have to have a good story to tell. And uh, I thought I had a great story. And, <laughs> but as I mentioned earlier, you know, I didn't write it with the thoughts of getting it published. I wrote it for myself because yep. I wanted to document my thoughts and my experiences. So, but yeah, anyone can write a book. Absolutely. As long as you have a good story. Right. So on your journey, it sounds like you've learned a lot about cat ownership as well as community cats, having outdoor kitties in your community. You said you have some outdoor cats just at your own house. Was that through the Enfield Community Cat Project or those cats were also inherited with the house? Did you learn about community cats on your own or was it more through the Community Cat Project that you learned about other cats other than kitty? Well, I've rescued several cats over the years after Kitty came into my life and brought him in the house and got him shaved at the groomers and cleaned him up and got him all shots. And he helped me to develop a love for cats. And several years after I first met Kitty, probably about two years, I met another cat. He had been living at an apartment complex and it appeared that he had been abandoned. So I, uh, you know, decided what the heck uh, I would rescue him, and I brought him home and got him cleaned up. Took, took him to the groomers and had all the fleas and ticks taken off him, and uh, got him his shots and 
you know, he uh, still living with me to this day, and I've done that with several other cats as well. Now, you had mentioned the cats that are currently living in my backyard that I feed. They're mostly feral cats. There could be a couple, one or two stray cats, but they're mostly feral cats. I assume they're feral because when I go outside, they run away. Yeah. Where some, yep. some of the other ones will actually stay on the porch and wait for me to put the food down. <laughs> but they don't mm-hmm. let me get near them either. Yeah. So. Yep. so you need to make sure that they're all ear tipped so that they're all spayed and neutered. Make sure that that happens. Kitten season is upon us, and do we have a webinar for you? Listen and chat with Hannah Shaw, the kitten lady, on Saturday, June 17th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time and learn everything you need to know about saving kittens' lives. She'll be talking all about kittens and bottle babies, too. This webinar will cover the ins and outs of kittens, including an overview of issues impacting cats and kittens, how to set up your home, manage your time, and make fostering fun, how to properly feed, clean, and provide basic medical care to a kitten, how to get involved in your local community. To sign up, go to www.communitycatspodcast.com and click on the link on the homepage to sign up. We'll see you then. Are you new to the Community Cats Podcast? Don't know what to listen to first? Feel free to check out the listening module tab where we have grouped shows together by topic so you can listen to a bunch of shows around the same topic. Just click on the listening module tab at www.communitycatspodcast.com and enjoy learning about community cats. Can you tell me a little bit about the Enfield Community Cat Project and what they're about? Sure. They got started about a year ago. The person who runs the group, Dawn Trainer Struck, just decided that she has a love for cats like me and all other cat lovers. And she decided that she wanted to help the stray and feral cats in the area. And she started this cat rescue group. And they do the TNR, the Trat Neuter neutering and return and she also has several feral cat colonies that she uh, tends to and feeds and she's trapped a lot of kittens this spring that she's currently taking care of the group has a whole network of cat fosters and the people are taking care of these kittens until they can get adopted out i think They've actually been really good for the community. A lot of people participate. I can't tell you the exact number because people are always coming and going from the group. But uh, I think it's a great organization, and I'm real happy to uh, be a part of it. One organization that I would suggest that you look into is Our Companions in Connecticut. Susan Linker is the head of that group, and she was on the Community Cats podcast, episode 182. And, you know, being a new organization, I know how tough it can be. And she's been in Connecticut. She runs a sanctuary in the Manchester, Hartford, Connecticut area. And they do some great work for cats. And she would be a wonderful mentor to any young and new organization in Connecticut. I'm I'm a big fan of introducing folks to each other, you know, in their states so that you can partner up and work together and be able to be more effective and, and proactive. And actually in Connecticut, there are some areas of the state where there aren't many kittens at all. And so with the networking, you're able to sort of share the load. If you get overwhelmed in a pocket area with a lot of kittens, you're able to spread them out amongst other organizations so you're not taking care of the situation all on your own and feeling overwhelmed. Well, Stacey, I absolutely have heard of our companions. Um, I haven't had an opportunity to team up with them yet for any fundraisers, but I have. In addition to teaming up with Enfield Community Cat Project, I've also teamed up with a couple of or several other groups in the state. I participated in a fundraising event with Cat Tail a couple of months back, Cat Tales is a cat rescue group out of Middletown, Connecticut. I've also teamed up with a couple of the other cat rescue groups as well. And I typically what I do is I stand behind the table with them as people walk by in the front of a shopping center, for example, and we'll ask people if they're interested in participating in cat rescue fundraisers. Sometimes I sell my books. I always donate a portion of my proceeds to the event, the cat rescue event. So, um, you know, I've certainly been doing that and, you know, getting to know lots of different people in the cat rescue community here in Connecticut and in Western Massachusetts as well. 
So thinking about your volunteer role as a marketing representative, one thing working with many smaller groups is everybody gets involved, so involved in the doing, and it's hard enough to even think about fundraising, let alone marketing as its own standalone sort of person and representative. Would you be willing to share sort of what your tasks are as the marketing representative for nonprofit, just to give as an example, because another smaller organization might want to write down these tasks and say, hey, maybe we should find a volunteer that can cover these areas also. Well, one of the things I've done for Enfield Community Cap Project is uh, several months back, we had a fundraiser at one of the local supermarkets, and I put together a press release that we sent out about a week before the event, and the announcement was printed in one of the local newspapers about two or three days before the event. It was The event was held on a Saturday morning at, at one of the local supermarkets, and we raised over $1,700 in donations that day. Wow, that's fantastic. That's great. Yeah, and truckloads and carloads of cat food. People were going into the supermarket, buying these big, big bags of cat food, and then bringing them out and giving them to us on their way out out of the uh, supermarket. So, I mean, that was a hugely successful event. And I partially attribute that to the success of the press release and the fact that it appeared in one of the local newspapers a couple of days before. Yeah, no, that that's great. And something that you think might be a, a small event all of a sudden turns into a surprising success. Last night, I was having a conference call with several of the groups that participate in the Community Cats Grants program, where groups do a brand new fundraiser that they've never tried before, and the Community Cats Grants will match up to $1,000 of spay neuter money with those fundraising efforts. And we were doing a review call with about 15 different groups that were participating in my second round. And many of them have had events where they've raised well over the thousand dollars. And they've just been so surprised at the success of doing a first time event or a first time fundraiser and not realizing how successful they can be or how potentially easy some fundraising can be. You do have to be strategic about your fundraising because you can sometimes spend a lot of time and effort on something that doesn't raise a lot of money. But then there are other opportunities out there where you can easily raise 1000 or $2,000. So I think that's a fantastic example of trying something new, and it, it paid off tremendously. Yeah, it worked out real well. I mean, we've had events where we haven't raised that much money. So when you say, you know, over $1,700, that's really a successful event. Right, right. So I want to just take a, a, a jump back here, Sean, to your book, The Kitty Who Rescued Me, After I Rescued Him. Before we started recording, we were talking about actually Amazon, and I was looking at the page, and it looked like you had quite a few five-star reviews. Uh, so congratulations on that, as well as congratulations on your award, on um, the, being the finalist in the 2017 International Book Awards. And so congratulations on both of those areas. If folks were interested in purchasing the book or contacting you, finding out more details, how would they do that? Well, certainly locally, actually quite a few bookstores are carrying my book locally. But if someone doesn't live in the you know, North Central or Western Massachusetts area, they could simply get it off Amazon, go to the search bar, type in the kitty, and hit enter, and that usually the fourth or fifth hit. So, you know, Amazon would certainly be the easiest way to do it. I have been getting it into some of the wholesalers, and mainly Ingram, Ingram Content Group. They're carrying my book, and they can sell it to bookstores like Barnes & Noble, for example. They buy books wholesale from the wholesalers, and they can get it at Ingram. I'm also in the process of getting it into some other wholesalers as well. Certainly, Amazon would be the easiest way. I mean, I've had people purchase my book and read it and then review it in countries like Germany, in the UK, in Canada. I mean, you know, Amazon certainly gives you a worldwide reach when uh, distributing your book or, or any type of products for that matter. 
That's great. That's uh, excellent. And if there are folks that are interested in contacting you directly, how would they do that? Yeah, they can shoot me off an email at Sean P. Flynn at Yahoo.com. That's S H A W N T, as in Patrick, S L Y N N, at Yahoo.com. And Sean, yeah, go ahead. They can also reach out to me on Facebook, too. I have a over 1,600 Facebook friends. The large majority of them are cat people <laughs> like myself and like you, Stacey. So, you know, you can reach out to me on Facebook. Be happy to connect. That's certainly a great way to keep in touch. And, Sean, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Um, no, I, I think that's it. Obviously, I've been promoting my book. I have a lot of events. I've done a lot of events at local uh, bookstores. I participated in a ton of cat rescue events. I actually went to a cat show this past Saturday in Auburn, Massachusetts. The Cat oh. Fanciers Federation Peace, Love, and Cats National Cat Show. And that was a great time. And I have a bunch of events coming up in June. I have one at the local Enfield Public Library. I have another event in June at R.J. Julia Booksellers in Madison, Connecticut. And I have another event coming up in July at the Avon Free Public Library. I've actually been asked to participate in their local author festival this summer. Wonderful. Sounds like you've got got a lot on your agenda. But if there are organizations who participate in any sort of community events in the New England area, it sounds like you'd be willing to, to go on the road a bit. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's great. Sean, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on the show, and I hope we'll have you on in the future. Stacy, thank you. I'd be happy to talk with you again at any time. Thanks again for inviting me on your program today. Are you starting to think about that special gift? Why not give the gift of a Community Cats podcast branded t-shirt, coffee mug, bag, or other item? This is the perfect way to spread the word about helping Community Cats. The proceeds from the sales will go to support the Community Cats podcast and the Community Cats Grants program, which helps small groups grow their fundraising programs to be able to fund more spay-neuter programs for free-roaming cats. Go to www.communitycatspodcast.com and click on our shop button in the menu bar today to get that perfect Community Cat gift right now. Thank you, everybody, for supporting the show.